are cholesterol-related compounds. In order to go from um, the precursor of vitamin D, which is called vitamin D3, to the active form uh, of vitamin D, which is actually down here, okay, you have to uh, expose this molecule to UV light. Okay? I'm sorry, not to go from here to here, to go from 7 dehydro over to here. You have to have UV light. That's a critical step in the process of synthesizing vitamin D. It's why you don't want to go absolutely without sunlight. What a lot of people are discovering these days, um, because of concerns of the sun, and I'm one of those people, is that they uh, find that they're frequently deficient in vitamin D. Your doctor can check it. Um, the darker your skin is, the more uh, difficulty you have making vitamin D in the, in the northern or far southern latitudes because there's not enough UV in the um, UV light in the sunlight to make a, a lot of vitamin D. My wife is from India, and she discovered, to her surprise, that she was quite deficient in vitamin D on one of her physicals. Fortunately, got that taken care of, but nonetheless, it's important to keep an eye on. So you want to get some sun. Tanning boost, like I said, uh, have some real problems, and we don't want to get sun. We don't want to get UV in that way, because the wavelengths that they use for that are very, very uh, carcinogenic. Okay? And I know some of you are probably rolling your eyes now, thinking, "Oh, I go to a tanning booth. Don't look at me, Kevin." Uh, that always happens. But uh, I, I like to say that it makes about as much sense to go to a tanning booth as it makes to start smoking. Yeah. So, so th from this form to this form requires ultraviolet light. Okay. And again, you don't need to worry about the names and so forth. I think it's important to understand the overall process. Okay, yeah. That's right. If you had all these if you had all the stuff in the world right here and you didn't get any ultraviolet light, you'd have a problem. Yep. So you gotta get some. You gotta get some ultraviolet light. Absolutely. Okay, vitamin D. Um, a little bit behind, but that's life, I guess. Vitamin E, I'll just simply show you the structure. Vitamin E has a slight resemblance to vitamin A. They're not related, actually, but it does look a little bit like it at first glance. You'll see that this is a very, very nonpolar compound. The only um, oxidizable guy is right here, and this guy actually becomes oxidized to protect other things uh, when they uh, oxidize. So this guy gets oxidized instead of, say, your cell membranes or something like that. So it's a protective mechanism. By sort of sacrificing itself, it gets oxidized more readily than more important things um, in your body. Vitamin K, as I said, uh, involved in blood clotting again. You see why these are fat soluble. Notice this guy just has virtually nothing on it. It's polar. There's a long tail right here um, that um, is uh, nonpolar. OK. Um, Vitamin K does play, um, I, actually, I, I will just briefly mention this here. Vitamin K does play a role, as I said, in blood clotting. And it's involved in modifying a, um, an important protease, or at least a, a precursor of a protease, called prothrombin. So I mentioned in class earlier that when we talked about covalent modification, that our blood clotting system has a series of proteases. One cleaves the next, cleaves the next, cleaves the next, and ultimately helps the uh, body to make a, uh, a clot. Okay? That happens um, with a series of zymogens. We talked about zymogens. The inactive forms are being converted to the active forms. And we want that to happen wherever there's a wound. So where we have a wound, we want to make sure that we, we um, uh, make sufficient amounts of um, uh, clot so that we don't bleed to death. And vitamin K plays a role in that process. So vitamin K is associated with blood clotting. Okay. And what happens is prothrombin is a, a, is a zymogen. So it's an inactive form. It has to be activated during the clotting process. Vitamin K does not, active, does not activate it. Instead, vitamin K does something interesting. It takes and it modifies the glutamic acid residues by adding an extra carboxyl to them. <coughs> Adds an extra carboxyl group to the, vitamin, to the glutamic acid residues in prothrombin. Why is that important? Well, by adding that extra carboxyl group, prothrombin will bind to calcium where it wouldn't bind to calcium before. Now, prothrombin, when it binds calcium, guess what's released at the site of the wound where you have a wound? Calcium. Prothrombin gets localized to the wound 
because vitamin K makes this happen. If you don't have vitamin K, prothrombin does not get held to the site of the wound, and you bleed to death because prothrombin becomes activated later and then makes the, uh, the uh, it actually converts a, 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 um, uh, a, a precursor protein called fibrinogen into fibrin, which makes the clot. It's a long story, so I'll repeat that, all right? So vitamin K takes prothrombin, a zymogen, so it's a protease, and prothrombin gets a carboxyl group. Extra carboxyl group allows it to bind to calcium. Calcium is present at the site of the wound. Prothrombin stays at the site of the wound. At the site of the wound, there's a series of things that will convert prothrombin into thrombin, and thrombin will then catalyze the reaction that's necessary to make the clot. Now, what happens if you don't have vitamin K? Well, as I said, if you don't have vitamin K, you bleed to death because you can't have a clot formed without prothrombin being at the site of the wound. So you hear people who are on blood thinners. Okay? One of the types of blood thinner inhibits the ability of vitamin K to work. It inhibits vitamin K. Okay? One type of blood thinner is also known as rat poison. Warfarin is a blood thinner. It mimics vitamin K, but it stops this carboxylation from happening. And what happens is that this guy then uh, uh, can't be made. The rat that eats too much of it bleeds to death, usually internally. You don't go find a bloody rat. Oh my God, I poisoned the rat, and there's the bloody rat. They bleed internally. And the same thing will happen to a person who takes the same compound. When we give people blood thinners, we're giving them basically rat poison in controlled quantities. And if you give a person too much, what happens is they hemorrhage and they can bleed internally to death. They may have a hemorrhage in their brain. They may have their problems. So people who are on blood thinner have to get the, the level of blood thinner checked periodically so they don't make too much. We give people blood thinner if they're prone to clotting. So we've got a de delicate balance. You clot too much, you've got a problem. You clot too little, you've got a problem. And so that's sort of balanced with um, the uh, blood thinners that they're given. Yes, sir? Warfarin, okay, so his question is, why did warfarin pr uh, prevent the clotting? The reason it prevents the clotting is it looks like vitamin K and inhibits this reaction from occurring so that you don't get this extra carboxyl put onto here. Without this extra carboxyl, this guy will not bind to calcium, and so it will not stay at the site of the wound. So there's nothing at the wound to help form the clot. Okay? Yes, sir? So would a blood thickener just... A blood thickener, one way to do it would be to add vitamin K. That's used sometimes in surgery. Uh, to help to uh, facilitate uh, clotting. Yeah? We don't talk about thickeners much, and most people's problems that they have, uh, they don't have not too little, they have too much. I had, I had talked about yeah, okay. Yeah, that'd be a real, a real good case, yeah, where you did that. Okay. Well, that's what I want to say about that. And the last thing I'm going to say now is about prostaglandins. These things are sort of a little disconnected, but these are all lipid compounds. Prostaglandins are fascinating compounds. They're involved in everything from uterine contraction to headaches to bleeding to all kinds of uh, physiological processes. And they have odd structures. Okay, prostaglandins look something like this. They are made from a fatty acid known as arachidonic acid, and yes, I think that's an important fatty acid name to know. They're made from arachidonic acid. Okay? Here's some various prostaglandins, and we're not going to worry about the names or the structures of these. These guys are called eicosanoids because eicosanoid means it has 20 carbons, and arachidonic acid has 20 carbons. One of the things that happens in, with uh, prostaglandins is that they're associated with pain. Okay? They are associated with pain. And I don't have the figure that I want, so I'm going to have to describe this to you. Okay? When your body's making prostaglandins, wherever they're, they're present, you're going to feel pain. Okay? One of the places that can happen, if a bee stings you, one of the things that happens is your body releases an enzyme 
that cuts arachidonic acid off of the membranes. We find arachidonic acid as fatty acids inside of membranes. When you have free arachidonic acid in your body, then what happens is that arachidonic acid is very quickly converted into prostaglandins. Prostaglandins stimulate a swelling response and a pain response. So prostaglandins are involved in swelling and pain. If you have a headache, you're probably making too many prostaglandins. Now, how do you stop all these pains? Well, what you do is you take uh, something called an NSAID, N-S-A-I-D. NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Mouthful of the name. If you want to simply call it NSAID, which is what most people want to do, that's fine. And I'll refer to it in class as an NSAID. NSAIDs inhibit the enzyme that makes prostaglandins. These guys are known as painkillers. So pain, an NSAID is a painkiller because it's inhibiting the production of prostaglandins. They're called non-steroidal because one of the ways to stop prostaglandins from being made is to use steroids. And in severe cases, that's dumb. But it's not a good idea in general to be using steroids just to kill your pain. Non-steroidal things that are, are um, used include aspirin. Aspirin is an NSAID. Aspirin is preventing the production of prostaglandins. Okay. You can take ibuprofen. That's an NSAID. There was a controversy a few years ago when there were a new group of inhibitors of prostaglandin synthesis that were released that at first looked very promising. They were called COX-2 inhibitors. Anybody ever hear of COX-2 inhibitors? You've heard of it? Okay. So aspirin and ibuprofen are what are called COX-1 inhibitors. COX is the name of the enzyme that makes the prostaglandins, COX. COX-1 enzymes produce that. Well, it turns out our body has about three different classes of COX enzymes. One uh, that is most abundant everywhere, and it's, it's all over our body. And importantly, that COX enzyme is in our digestive system. Okay, We make prostaglandins in our digestive system not to give us a stomachache, but some prostaglandins are involved in stimulating the growth of intestinal tissue. You might wonder why, and the reason why is we have to continually remake intestinal tissue because it's a fairly hostile environment that our food and so forth is passing through, and those cells are continually sloughing off of our intestinal wall. So the intestines and the, the prostaglandin stimulates the growth of, of replacement tissue and everything is fine. If you take aspirin over a long period of time, you inhibit those enzymes and you start having what some people describe as ulcers and stomach problems as a result of that because they're not making the prostaglandin that's necessary to replace that stomach tissue. Okay. Well, when people discovered that some of the things associated with, say, arthritis, pain, and so forth were caused not by COX-1 enzymes, but by COX-2 enzymes, the idea was, well, perhaps we could find something that's specific for the COX-2 enzymes that won't hurt the COX-1 enzymes that's in our stomachs. And that's when they started looking for these other um, anti-inflammatory drugs. Vioxx was one of them. Okay. Celebrex. And they spent billions of dollars investigating these. They found them. And in fact, at first, they looked like they were really great. They were the miracle drug because for people with rheumatoid arthritis or something like that, they could take this. They didn't have stomach effects and so forth. They weren't having problems. It turned out they had side effects related to heart tissue. And unknown at the time, some of the COX-2 enzymes uh, were involved in heart, in heart function. Okay. But most of the COX-2 enzymes got taken off of the shelves as a result of that. There are still a couple that are out there that are used in very, very controlled and selective conditions for people who may have very severe pain issues. But for the most part, that was, an invest that was a, um, a big money losing thing for the um, uh, pharmaceutical companies. OK, make all sense? That brings me to a song, if you'd like a song. OK, we need a song, I think. Okay, you guys were a little better last time singing, but to this one I'm going to need help because this one is a very difficult song to sing, and so I want to hear you sing loudly. It's to the tune of Oklahoma. 